gets us through all of those times and all of those things. And in the whole time, he's saying, be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Don't cause trouble. Just let the Lord lead you and let his words be your words. And so as we sit here this morning, I just want you to take a deep breath. Because we're here together corporately to worship. And in your heart, if you do not have that peace, that love, and that joy, it's the perfect peace, the perfect love, the perfect joy that comes from the Lord. And only He can provide it and give it to us. And so I just want us to sit a minute this morning and enjoy being in the presence of the only one that can bring all of that to our lives. Thank you. 
service today. Will we uh, open these altars. You feel God uh, speaking to your heart about uh, just a struggle in your life, a struggle in the life of a friend. We invite you to come and just give it to God because uh, God still answers prayer. Amen. God wants to hear from us. So let's uh, let's take that to Him in this day. Father, we, we thank you for this day. Father, Father, we thank you for the song that we just sung about how your love and your grace find us each every day. Father, your mercy find us each and every day. Father, uh, we know that we're not worthy. Father, we know that you also love us so much that you send your only son to die on the cross for us so that we might see your love and feel your love and know your love. And Father, we live in a world where there's still a lot of people that, that don't know that. They don't, they don't have that hope in their life. They don't have that joy in their life. And Father, we just pray that in the coming days and weeks as we go about our our work, our, our activities, Father, just the things that take us out of your community. Father, we pray that, uh, that you would put those folks in our in our path and we could have a conversation. Father, we could tell them a story of how you died for all of us. That we might have hope, we might have joy, we might have peace. And Father, we know that those things only come from knowing you as our personal Lord and Savior. Father, we just lift up to your community. Father, help us to go be a light in the community as we've sung about being a light this this morning. Father, help us to help Second Baptist Church to, to reflect that light. Help Second Baptist Church, Father, to be a beacon in your community that people drive by and see the parking lot full. Father, to drive by and hear the preaching, they hear the singing. And Father, to just stir something in, in them that they would want to come in and, and just find out what the what the excitement is, Father. And just allow us to uh, to share the share with them, Father, uh, what you're doing uh, amongst your church. Father, we just lift up to our schools, Father continue to pray for our teachers, continue to pray for our students. Father, that you just uh, protect them each day, Father, that you open their minds to, to the teaching, Father, that what they hear, that they will be receptive of, of the teaching, Father, and that uh, the, the things that they do and the things that they learn, Father, we want to be help them to be uh, just an uh, integral part of our community and help them to go on to, to, to inspire others to, to being all that they can be. Father, we, we pray for our missionaries around the world, Father, we know that so many of them face persecution each and every day. And Father, we just ask for your protection around them as they can go about sharing the gospel. Father, we pray for our military as they're stationed around the world protecting our freedoms. Father, we pray for your safety. We pray for their uh, protection. But Father, for each of us that, that's not called to go to, to China or Africa or wherever, Father, we know that we are, called, called to, we are called to go across the street, around the corner, across the yard, wherever it is, Father. This week, I pray for a boldness. I pray for a courage wisdom, that the decisions we make, that the, the opportunities we have, Father, we will not let them pass. Father, for those that we know that are hurting, physically, financially, spiritually, whatever it is, Father, that you put up on our, on our hearts, the words that we can say that bring joy, that bring impact in their life, Father, that would, would draw them to you. Father, we thank you for what you're doing here at Second Baptist Church. We thank you for what you've done this week. We thank you for what you're going to do today, the days and weeks to come. Father, as Brother Adam comes this morning, Father, I pray for a strong voice. I pray for conviction in, in the words that he shares. And Father, I pray that they're not his words, but the your words that you would speak through him on this day. Father, I pray for someone here that doesn't have that joy and hope, doesn't have you as the Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that they would not leave, it, leave this place without giving it to to you this day. Father, we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Oh, 
afraid you will fail, but he'll help you if you only take a step of faith. Come to all you long for. Let's try to let's try to understand peace because you can't make peace if you don't know what peace is. So often we try to look for peace in things like um, sorry I stepped on my shoestring. I'm gonna fall and you're gonna laugh if I leave. Yes. It. So, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> we try to look for peace in things like money, fame, relationships. Because um, the more money you have, the more at peace you'll be, right? every celebrity ever. But the thing we're looking for underneath all those things is security. We don't really want the money. We want the security that having a lot of money would afford us. You know, good insurance, a good place to live. You always got a house over your head. You got money in your belly. Now, we don't really want to be famous. We want the security that that gives us to, to, to think, feel like we have it all under control. So it's not those things things that you're wanting. It's the security that comes along. The security that you think they'll provide by providing this happiness. If I have more money, I'll be happy. If I'm, if I'm famous, I'll be happy. Um, if, I had, uh, if I had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, I'd be happy. If I was, if I, if, Lord, if I could only get married, that would solve all my problems. <laughs> Which happens to be true in my case. <laughs> I, I like to call this the, the if only attitude. Think about this. The, if only I had 
If, if only I had more money, I could do this. If only we had a bigger building, I could do this. If only we had, uh, if, if only we had ten people on staff at church, we could do all these great things. If only I had this, I could do all these things. But since I don't have this, I can't do that. A uh, rich man, I, I read an interview, a rich man was asked one time, and he's like, not the just kind of normal rich, but like like Warren Buffett rich. And they, they said, well, how much money will be enough? He said, just a little more. Just a little more. If only I had more of this, I could do that. And I, mean, I don't know who needs to hear this today, but somebody might need to hear it, and I've needed to hear it this week. But God has given you everything you need to do, everything he wants you to do right now. Amen. Amen. God has given this church everything we need to do, every single thing he wants us to do. And if we don't have it, he must not want us to do it yet. Amen. So maybe chill, pump the brakes a little bit, and let's say, what does God want me to do right now with what I have? I've had, to, I've had to pump the bricks so many times in my life. Because Amy, Amy knows this. My mouth gets ahead of my brain a lot of times. That's the reason we had like two, two ring bearers at our wedding. We had two or three flower girls. Um, I had one girl blowing bubbles just because I kept asking people to do stuff. And we just, yeah, but we don't have room for it. But they did it. <laughs> Am I the only one in here where my mouth gets ahead of my brain sometimes? Are you guys in <laughs> I saw one head shake and one hand raised. <laughs> Ephesians 2, chap Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. See, peace from the world ultimately is going to lead to hostility. Peace, if we're looking for peace only in our relationships, they're going to, they're going to lead to hostility. If you pour everything you have into this one relationship and you ignore God, I can tell you how that's going to end. I've been there. I think, John, you think your boy and mine was perfect. Oh, yours is perfect. <laughs> Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm going to get way off track. I don't, I don't stay. Peace from the world ultimately will lead to hostility. If we look for peace only in our jobs, like we, we've mentioned this a couple times, if we look for validation only in our jobs or our relationships, that's not going to get you anywhere. Ultimately, people will fail you. Church might fail you. Your boss might fail you. Unless you work for all the public schools. Your boss will never fail you. I got you. <laughs> Peace from the world ultimately leads to our hostility. And that's, that's why he who is our peace gave that peace to us. Because he knows that he is our peace and we can't do it without him. Yeah. That's why he did what he did, because he could see our poor, helpless little souls. We're never gonna be we're never gonna have peace. We're always gonna be fighting with each other. We're always gonna have this and that to say, we're always gonna be backbiting. People will always do these things unless they have he who is our peace with us. Because only through his flesh could that wall be broken. There was a wall of hostility surrounding our lives. Maybe as you're sitting here today, that wall may still be up. That wall still may be up, and you look, why don't I have any peace in my life? Why is my life so chaotic? Why am I hurting all the time? Why is it when I wake up, I feel like the day's pretty much already spent? Why is everything so chaotic in my life? Well, today is time to tear down those walls. Yes. I think God has given us everything we need to do, everything he would have us do right now in this moment. And God has placed you in this chair for everything that he has for you in this moment, at this time, on this day, in this building. Amen. 
Whether you wanted to come or not, whether some of you young people were maybe in a bad mood, you were made to come. Maybe some of you husbands were made to come up here. Your wives were made to come up here. You're still here, though. He got you here one way or another. And it, it leads us to this piece of uh, reconciliation. You, the Greek word for peace is Irene. 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 But you know it much better under the Hebrew word shalom. The Jews, when they greet people, they, they say shalom. It's, it's peace to you. Peace. I, I wish completeness. I wish wholeness on you. It literally, you translate this word shalom, and literally pictures the binding together again of that which has been separated or divided. So when we say shalom, we are, th we are talking about a peace that is together, a peace that is whole, a peace that is complete again. So in simpler terms, you, you want to look at it like shalom, to be at peace is to be made whole again. To be at peace is to fill that gap that your life has been missing. To fill that gap that you have chased so many rabbits down the world, rabbit holes in your life. You're, you're looking for happiness in the world. You're looking for happiness in relationships and money and fame. Do you have any famous people in here? No? Okay. To be at please, the true peace. I, I don't mean peace as in, well, I've got everything I need, so I don't need to go to church. I've got everything I would have prayed for anyway, so I really don't need to be there. That before, and you kind of you, you want to, don't you? Just, am I the only one that when I hear that, you just kind of want to just come on, let me smack some sense into you? I don't need trouble today. In simpler terms, like I said, it is to be made complete, it is to be made whole, a completeness that speaks beyond our circumstance to someone who is above our circumstance. It speaks to Jesus Christ. It says in Colossians chapter 1, For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. If you want to look for your peace, come, come fall down at the cross, because you will not find it anywhere else. Before we can make peace, we have to come to peace. Before we can make peace, we have to allow the ultimate peacemaker to make peace in our own lives. Because without him, all we're doing is trying to fix ourselves. And isn't that, isn't that the way it goes sometimes? We try to fix ourselves. We try, it's, it's like we, we create this sense of immediacy in our life where, where we we need to be fixed right now. And if I need something right now, I just have to do it myself. I don't have time to wait. I don't have time to come to church every Sunday and pray to God that he fixes my life. I need it right now. How many of us have tried to fix our lives on our own because we're just, we're just impatient? Any impatient people in here? Yeah, I think you all, a couple of you are honest. We need to take care of it on our own because, because that's who we are, right? My ego says, I can fix it on my own. I don't have to wait for anybody. My ego says, well, I'm the, I'm the teacher. I don't need to pray God to help me. God put me in this position because he thinks I can do it on my own. I, I, can I ask you guys if I ever, if you ever hear me say that for some odd, stupid reason, can you throw something at me? Can you just say, hey, Adam, it's time to wake up, Bubba. Okay, it's time to come back to the real world, okay? Let's go. He's a good boy. The author Kent Hughes says, what is needed is a radical change in the human race if there is to be peace. No one can master even one of the attitudes on their own. What he's saying is we, there needs to be something beyond ourselves to, to even approach these beatitudes, to even approach the character of the kingdom, because we can't do it. We can't just try to be good on our own, better on our own. 
we can't make ourselves into what we need to be. But when we take these, these broken pieces, because we, we take the broken pieces of our lives that we've been trying to put together for so long, we've been trying to, to really glue ourselves together, but when we take these pieces, and we just really, that's what we're doing when we come down here to the altar and we give our lives to Christ. What we're doing is we're taking all the broken pieces of my life. And I, I picture it as I'm just carrying on here. Um, just throw them down. And to truly experience the grace of God, the peace of God, this is what you have to do. And I think this is where it creates a gap so many people because I can do it on my own. I don't need somebody to do this. So, but when we truly get to that point of humility because that's what it takes to give your life to Christ. It takes humility. I picture just, just, just putting all the pieces, just piling them in your shirt and just coming down here and just, just lay them down. And what we're saying when we come down here is I can't do this on my own anymore. Can't do it. I need somebody to make that peace that I cannot make on my own. And the creature man said, "This is where to go." Yeah. Really, God's word told the creature man that's where it's, this is where you need to go. So I will challenge you. I'm going to give you a little hint of the invitation today. I will challenge you to take those broken pieces and out of the pews. Pick them up. And I'll tell you what, you don't want to do it alone. You don't want to come down here on your own. Give me one of these. I'll come down there. I will help you carry the pieces to your broken life up here, and we will do it together. As I keep saying, if we walk through those doors, you will never be alone again. No one sits alone. No one serves alone. Sometimes our lives are broken so bad that we need help to carry the pieces, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. We keep trying to carry them on our own, and they're, they're, they're falling through the cracks. The piece, and and we're, we're scattered so far down, up and down the aisles that we, we just, by the time we get here, we're, we're empty and I don't even know what to pray for. So let me tell you what, if, if, you, need, if you need the peace that God gives you, and you're scared to come down here on your own, I can, I can see almost 100 people in here that would be willing to come down here with you. Give me a head nod. Give me something. I will come down here with you. I needed help before. I've got an entire row full of people that had to help me pick up the pieces. My, my parents who are matching today. <laughs> they're, they're the Twinkies over there in teal shirts. You know how many times they had to pick up the pieces in my life and tell me to quit being stupid and get yourself together? <laughs> enough. Enough. When we take these pieces and we, and we lay them down, what we're looking for is peace. And what we're looking for doesn't, doesn't necessarily happen right away, but we begin to build on that. John 14, verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let your hearts, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You don't have to be afraid anymore because you're not going to be alone anymore. When you have these pieces, you, you, you may not experience that, that overwhelming peace and everything's not going to be easy when you walk out the doors. But what you do know is you don't have to be afraid anymore because you're not going to be alone when you go out there anymore have a, 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 a standing army in these pews ready to go out there and fight with you. You have a man who, who God has placed here for such a time as this not to lead you along on a leash. That's not my job. My job is to walk arm in arm with you out there so you know that you don't have to be alone anymore. My job is not to sit in the office and, and study and, and wait to I hear Larry's keys jingling. That's how I know it's time to start the work day when I hear Larry's keys. 
My job is to be out there with you. And our, your job is to be out there with me. It's a reciprocal sort of thing. Our job as a church is to be out there and to go. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give you. So you don't have to be afraid anymore. And it is from this foundation that he takes away our fear. And it's from this foundation that we are made peacemakers. Perfect love drives out all fear. And then we can make peace. We are made witnesses to the completeness of his glory. The peace of his glory. Because that's what it is. That's what he ultimately did. In the, in, in, throughout eternity, we walk through those gates. We are at peace. Money doesn't matter anymore. Our relationships don't matter anymore. None of all, the only thing that matters is the glory of God and the peace that He gives us. We are made witnesses to the peace of His glory, to the completeness of His glory. And then you know what we're done? We're given marching orders. We are given marching orders to go. We go. We may make disciples of all nations. We go because people need peace in this world. Amen. Amen. Turn on the news. Watch these politicians fighting with each other. Well, he should be impeached. Well, he should be impeached. Well, you're stupid. Well, you're stupid. That's what it is. And I'm not talking politics with any of you. I want to. But the world needs peace, not even in the politics, political realm, but in the in the in the entertainment industry and all these things. We, people are looking for peace, and they're going to look for it. They're going to keep looking until they think they found it. And, wouldn't it be nice if the church was the church and we placed ourselves in a position to be the people that they looked, they went to? Yep. Wouldn't it be nice if the church was the church? Yes. A lot of times our, our job isn't to beat someone over the head with the gospel. I call this the Kirk Cameron approach. Are you, well, Renee, have you ever stolen anything? Well, you're a thief. You ever lied? Well, you're a liar. Have you ever... Have you ever Okay, well, well, but what we do have is you're a thief and a liar. You're going to hell unless you give yourself to Jesus right now. Right now. You've got to, you've got to do it. That's not our job. Our job is to love on people and to be there. So when that time comes and they are looking for peace, where are they going to go? Amen. I remember. They're going to say, well, I remember these, these ladies that were really nice to me at that Sunday school at Second Baptist. So I remember the deacons who they, they, they fed me popcorn at one of the block parties. Well, I remember they did this or they did that or they had this, this great thing. That's what I remember. Maybe, maybe they know what's going on. Maybe they can point me in the right direction. That's what we're doing. We're placing ourselves in a position to be that call when the peace of the people in this town is just upended it, it's every which way. We are made missionaries in the marketplace. You are missionaries at your job. You are missionaries at your school. You are a missionary at your home. You are a missionary on the phone. You are a missionary. Once you walk out those doors, you are a missionary in the marketplace. You are redeemed, and you have a role in making peace by taking the gospel to the streets. Let's take these streets back. What do you say? Amen. You, I, it is chaotic out there. People need peace. Let's take the gospel to the streets. Let's take it out there. Let's be missionaries in the marketplace. Because we are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And it's no accident this beatitude comes as the, the last one that describes the characteristics of the, of the kingdom. As we've gone through these and we started it. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who, who mourn over their sin. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are those who... who you're not really perfect. There are no perfect people in this church. I, I even heard one church say perfect people aren't allowed in this church. But if you never exhibit a poverty of spirit, if you have never mourned over your sin, if you have never hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you've never done any of these things, you're not going to be a peacemaker because I'm, I would submit to you that you don't really have any peace. 
you can pretend and you can gloss up the outside and you can do all these things, but if you've never truly in your heart experienced these beatitudes, <coughs> these characteristics of the kingdom, you're, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to us. You won't be a peacemaker because you won't have it yourself. And when you, throw, when you throw all these beatitudes together, the poverty of spirit and the hunger and thirst for righteousness and mourning and the meekness, and when you throw all these together, it's like, a, it's like a bowl of chili. You're putting them all in there, and what you get is a peacemaker. It's like I said, it's no accident that this is at the end because we have been leading to this point. You need, there's a foundation, and you lay the next step and the next step and the next step and the next step. And the summation of all these parts is peacemaker. This is what it looks like to go out into the world and to make peace. You have to have these characteristics of the kingdom. Peace. Peace is an investment. You know why it's an investment? Because it takes work. Like I, I talked to the kids just a minute ago. You try to make peace when you're at home and you guys get in a fight. It's, it's, it's going to take some work to make that right. Gentlemen, you, you get in a fight with your wife, it, it takes some work to make that peace, doesn't it? Somebody come on. Ooh. You have to remind her of what an angel she is. Ladies, same thing for you. You guys aren't perfect either. You create fights with your husband for no reason sometimes. Not you, honey. I'm talking about them. <laughs> is an investment because it takes water. You can almost think of us as a as a middleman. Christ has given us the peace. Peace. It is our job to build these bridges to reach the lost people and to get them to the healer. The work in making peace is building the bridge so that we may go get them and bring them back to the healer and say, okay, here is where your peace comes from. I can't get it to you. All I did is build a bridge. All I am is the middle man. All I'm doing is get me this guy and he will fix you. Adam can't fix you on your own. Harold can't fix you. David can't fix you. Nobody can fix you but the one who we built the bridge to. But, but what does that work look like? What does it look like to build the bridges to get these people to the peacemaker? Because if you read Matthew 5, 9, you, you tend to say, blessed are the peacemakers. And, and you kind of tend to picture some easygoing, you know, pacifist, sort of hippie, tree hugger. Hey, peace, brother. Let's just be cool, man. Let's, let's, let's just have peace. Why can't we all get along? What if there was a war and nobody showed up, man? Let's just lay back. Let's just love everybody. Let's not make any waves. Because if we don't make any waves, there's going to be peace, right? No. Did Jesus ever make waves when he came? Jesus came for the sole purpose to make waves. Because, if, but, but if nobody is offended, then we'll have peace, right? If we don't make any way, brother, we're going to have peace and harmony. If we don't, if we don't offend anybody, man, everybody's just going to get along. We can, we can hug each other and everything will be cool. There are a lot of 12-step uh, programs and, and, problem, and programs like Teen Challenge and, and AA who address the, the problems of addiction. And you know what the first step? First step is you gotta admit there's a problem. You have to admit that there is a problem. Because if you do not admit there's a problem, you're, you're, you're stuck in the mud. Ezekiel chapter 13. He's God is speaking through Ezekiel to the prophets of Ezekiel's time who, who are who sidestep the people's sin, who refuse to admit that there's a problem. He says, precisely because they have misled my people, saying peace when there is no peace, and because when they build a wall, these prophets smear it with whitewash. Say to those who smear it with whitewash that it shall fall. There will be a deluge of rain, and you, O oh great hailstones, will fall, and a stormy wind will break out. I 
swear I had this written before last night. You know the storm last night, wasn't there? Yeah. Everybody, everybody's house be okay? You know, I heard there's some baseball sized hail in Henrietta. Softball? Tennis ball. Tennis ball? Mm -hmm. Is it just big ones? Baseball. So the people are waking up tonight, this morning, to, to chaos in their yards, to chaos on their properties. And they, this is, you, you kind of get the picture of what Ezekiel is talking about here. He says, these people that say peace when there is no peace, these people that sidestep the problem, these people who choose to ignore and not admit that there's a problem, this is what's coming. Softball size hail and sideways winds and a hurricane force rain and trees that are busted in the wind. All these things are coming because you're, what you're doing when you, when you refuse to admit that there's a problem, you refuse to make waves because you want to keep the peace, what you're doing is giving them a paper thin hope. You're giving them a paper thin hope, and what happens when it rains during paper? What happens to rain with paper? What happens to paper when it gets wet? It's no good for you. Do we want to give them a paper thin hope? Or do we want to give them real, tangible hope that you can hold on to? And you can grasp with both hands and you can say, I, I'm not going to let it go. I know if I stay close to this hope that I will not fail. I know if I stay close to this hope, I will not fail. prophets here, they say peace when there is no peace. They're, they're not addressing the problem. And it, because keeping people distracted and happy means there's going to be peace, right? If you keep them distracted, if you keep them happy, if you keep them just... That, that, really, that means job security for these prophets. If I tell them what they want to hear, they're going to be happy all the time. And if they're happy all the time, I get to keep my job. The prophet's job is not to make everybody happy, is it? A teacher's job is not to make everybody happy. A superintendent's job is not to make everybody happy. A pastor's job is not to make everybody happy. But do you want paper thin hope or do you want something real? Maybe, don't we, don't we tend to do this in our own lives? We, we kind of sidestep the problem we don't want to deal with it. We, we maybe... Maybe there are things in our life even now that we've, we've kind of ignored because I, just, I don't want to deal with it. Because I know it's going to be like ripping that band-aid. I, I just, I don't want to do it. And we know our life, we're not really going to have any peace until we address this. But the fact that we will have to address it someday terrifies us because I don't, I don't want to do it. So that's what we do. We, we say peace when there is no peace, and then the storm comes and we are broken because we have never addressed the problem that we needed to do months ago, years ago. And we, we settle into such a rhythm in our day-to-day -day lives, we think, well, that's a tomorrow problem. I'll, I'll worry about the tomorrow. I'll worry about it tomorrow. You know what? That sounds like a problem for future me. If future me can deal with it, why would I deal with it now? Not my problem. His problem. And we settle into this, this rhythm of our day to day lives when we know we have this thing hanging over our head, that we know that when it comes time to address it, that's going to upset the balance of our lives and our lives will go to chaos for a moment. But sometimes you have to fight through the chaos to get to peace. And how often do we let things go for way too long? Because we don't want to or we are scared to deal with something. Maybe that's today you, you, you got something hanging over your head. Maybe you got something at home that you need to deal with. Maybe you got something with someone in this room that you need to deal with. And you're you're avoiding it because you know you either you're gonna feel embarrassed or you're gonna feel scared. Or you're gonna feel like no, they're gonna be mad at me. But we're gonna have to deal with it. We can't say peace when there is no peace. And I am going to challenge you today to address whatever it is you are putting off. Somebody in here has got something hanging over their head they need to deal with, and they haven't done it. I don't know specifically. I'm not calling anyone out. The Lord told me somebody's got something. 
Is it time to deal with it? Or are you going to keep saying peace where there is no peace and you're going to let this, you're going to let it control your life until the storm comes and your life goes into chaos? Whatever amends you need to make with somebody or whatever is some kind of sin that you need help with, whatever it is, maybe you're scared of what people will think, but that's, that's we're all, we're all broken people helping broken people. If you feel embarrassed about your sin, come talk to me and I'll tell you some of the stupid things that I've done in my life. I'll make you feel a little better about yourself. Or talk to Amy, she'll tell you some stories. She's probably going to be in the mood to do that after today. <laughs> To get people to Jesus, you will have to make waves. To get people to peace, you will have to fight through the chaos. To get people to peace, to get people to the gospel, because the gospel is confrontational by nature. The gospel confronts our sin. The gospel is here to address our sin. Jesus came to make waves. That's why he came to make waves. You know how many tables he turned over and how many... People, he said, get behind me, Satan. He came to make waves because that's what needed to be done. And sometimes you need to make waves in the church. Got any wave makers in here? No, I won't point anybody out. Just the one reading the newspaper back there. No, is she awake? <laughs> I'm sorry, I realized I don't know you. <laughs> I couldn't see your face. I didn't know I didn't know it. If there are no waves, water gets stagnant. Stagnant water breeds bacteria and disease. These are unseen killers that will slowly tear a person down. Much like when a church gets stagnant. These, these silent killers, these, this bitterness that greed because we're not making waves, we're not addressing it. This, this discontentment, this, this anger, this, this oh, whatever it is that we're, we're, we're letting just bubble under the surface because we know when we do it, it's going to be hard and it's going to be tough. But as long as that we remember, as long as we always try to remember that we are here for the same mission, yeah, we're going to fight. We fight behind closed doors and we worship God outside. No, I'm not, I'm not, and a lot of these churches will die a slow death because nobody's willing to put themselves out there in a vulnerable position, vulnerable position to make waves. But I'm not advocating that we just make waves for no reason. I'm not advocating for people to just, 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 just making waves and causing a mess just for the sake of causing a mess. Because y'all know, know who I'm talking about, don't you? You know, I mean, not who I'm talking about. You know the kind of people I'm talking about, right? Just, just stirring it up. My friend Sonny that was here last week, he used to tell me those kind of people are like a paddle boat in a septic tank. They just, just stirring it up. I checked with two people if I should say that from here, and they, they said it was okay. So if you have questions, come talk to me later. Look, people just stirring it up for no reason. Because you don't. There must be a purpose in waves. There must be a purpose in what we're doing. There must be a purpose when you go to address someone that you know is going to cause an issue. When you go to do these things, there must be a purpose behind your waves. Now, that's not always saying that you have to necessarily make waves because there is some calm in the storm sometimes. It is not always a fight to make peace. Because as God dispenses his character to us, he begins to give us this, this sort of dignified calmness, this meekness that he talked about a few verses earlier. And when you have this, this sort of peace that God has given you, what you can say is he is my only rock and he is my salvation. He is my fortress and I shall not be shaken. Amen. So if we are to become peacemakers in this chaotic world, they must see that our willingness to fight is strong. Our willingness to fight. If we were, if we were to fight the powers of darkness under he who is the ultimate peacemaker, yes, we will absolutely punch you in the mouth. That's what needs to be done. But our faith must be strong. It's the, this, this sleeping giant. When, 
when the, the Japanese attacked uh, Pearl Harbor, they, they, they went to this Japanese general and they said, well, are, do, you, do you feel, uh, I, I forget how exactly they asked me, they said, do you feel accomplished or do you feel like this mission was a success? And I, I, I believe the men said, oh, you're all we've done is awaken the sleeping giant. Our willingness to fight must be strong. But our faith must be strong. Because we can't fight on our own. If all we're doing is going out there looking for a fight, you're going to get beat up. Trust me. Above all, above everything else, above making peace, there, above all, there must be trust if there is to be peace. Because that's essentially what peace is. It is a trust between two parties that has made peace. When you give your life to Christ and He makes peace in your life, what you're doing is trusting Him with your eternity. When you make peace with your, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your kids, what you're doing is making peace with them. You are trusting them that it will be made right. And should we find our peace from Jesus Christ, we are placing our faith in Him and we are trusting that He is who He says He is and He will do what He said He will do. Amen. Because He has given us everything we need to do, everything we need to do right now. We trust that and we'll take it to the bank. Now, should we have peace amongst ourselves? There's going to be trust. There needs to be trust too. Should we have peace as a church? There must be trust. You know how this works, right? When, I, I don't have anything if you don't trust me. That's, I'm, somebody asked me what my, my vision was this first six months. I said, I'm, I'm building trust in the office. I need you to trust me. Because I may not be the smartest man. I may not be the brightest bulb in the pack, the sharp, sharpest tool. But above everything else, I need you to trust me. And it's not that I need you to trust me and I demand that you trust me. Let me show you why you can trust me. Amen. And it goes the other way. I, we, this church, can't, we can't do anything. I don't trust you. You trust me, I trust you. Then we're going to have peace. Yeah. We trust each other. Then we can get what? If we don't trust, we can't do anything. I don't trust you to do what you said you're going to do. I'm going to stop asking you to do anything. If I can't, if we say, hey, I need this done, and you say, oh, yeah, I got no problem, Pastor, and then they go, and it never happens, oh, stop asking me. If you don't trust your pastor, this doesn't work. If the community does not trust the church, this will not work. They must be able to trust us to allow us to make peace in this community. Because if they don't trust us, if we go out there like a bunch of, you know, wants, just, 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 Blasting our message everywhere with no respect for who they are and what they've done. If we do this, they're not going to trust us. And if you lose that trust, you can destroy a lifetime of trust in just a few minutes. Amen. And how long does it take to build that trust back? I would argue that once you destroy trust in that man, that you'll never really fully have it back. It's always going to be in the back of their minds, isn't it? I don't trust you because you did this. I have forgiven you, but I don't trust you. I've had people like that in my life. But, but what does this mean for us? He says, blessed are the people who live this kingdom culture. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be sons of God or children of God. Because families trust each other, right? We trust the Father. Father, I think He trusts us to do the mission. He knows us. And I feel like the beauty of the gospel is He knows us and He chooses to trust us anyways. Because He knows we're knuckleheads. We know, he knows we're going to screw up. He knows we're going to do this. He knows we're going to do that. But we are children of God because we trust each other. We are in the family now, so you give your life to Christ and you give him marching orders. What you're doing is side by side. I trust the man next to me. I trust the woman next to you that we're going to go out and do the job. You know the funniest thing or the scariest thing about raising a kid? It's 
watching them grow and they're blossoming and they're, they're a good boy. And then as they get older, they start to show signs of, of your personality. <laughs> Judah trained now. When I go like this, Judah, he'll go. I get down like this, and he knows it's time to scare Mama. <laughs> but I'm still working on keeping him quiet until we get up there, so we can actually scare her. He's a worker father. Usually, uh, we'll, we'll walk behind her like this, and he'll start giggling about halfway there. She turns and sees us, and she lets us. She lets him scare. Because ah! he's seen Daddy do this so many times. Because we have that big window like, inside our wall. One of our walls has this big window. And for some reason, maybe wanted to put the couch there. Well, actually, I think Shirley made put the couch there. Thank you, Shirley. But Amy likes to lay on this couch, and she doesn't pay attention to her surroundings. She's oblivious sometimes to what I'll do if I see Jude on the couch. And he's kind of he's kind of got to the point where he'll be he'll be quiet if I want to do it on my own. And I'll come up behind the window and I'll go, Rah! and that's when she actually gets scared. And she jumps and, quit it, stupid. <laughs> but Judah thinks that is the funniest thing in the world. He'll giggle and he'll laugh. <laughs> Got you. But one of the things about, about raising these children is you, you become sons of God. You become children of God. And you, we begin to take on his personality. Because we are... Children are watching us. They, they, they want to do what we do. They want to be just like us. But you know what? My mom will even will go to lunch with, my, with Amy and my dad. My mom sometimes will point at my dad and apologize to Amy. Say, I'm sorry, Amy. It's not getting better. <laughs> and then Amy says, wow, why did I get married? And, and let's, let me give you a little relationship advice for the men. Okay, are you ready? Just the men. Don't ever slip and tell her that she's just like her mother. <laughs> I don't care. I mean, her mother may be a wonderful, positive woman, which my mother-in-law actually is. But there's something about saying that to a lady that just, just boils her. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I mean, just dips like the, you know, that, that sweet spot. You want to just make a mad just like that. You are just like your mother. What did you say? So that's a little, little relationship advice one on one. If you need some more gentlemen, you can call me, uh, come to the office, I'll give you how to, I'll, I'll teach you how to treat your wives. But our goal, our heart's desire as children of God is to become just like Him. Our goal in our walk with Christ is to become just like the Father. So when He says, you are children of God, you are sons of God, He says, take my yoke on me and learn from me and become just like me. And as we see with our children growing up, they want to be just like us. That should be our relationship with God. Is I want to be just like Him. What can I do in my life? How can I make peace in my relationships? How can I do this? How can I do that? To become like God. Our goal, our heart's desire should be to become just like the Father. In Romans chapter 8, it says in verses 15 through 17, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. There's the kicker. This has been the plan all along. That we step out of that fear, these broken pieces that have created our lives, we step out of that fear into the peace of God and we become like him. Because as he calls us children of God, we are heirs to the kingdom. We have an eternity set aside for us in heaven. Should we only give him the broken pieces of our lives and say, I can't do this anymore, I need you to do it. 
We are inheritors. You know what inheritors mean? It means you're going to get the riches someday. You're going to get, you're going to get the glory of the kingdom. Now, 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 don't miss this, and we'll get into a little bit of this next week. We are inheritors of persecution on this side. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be not going to be a cake. Well, we are inheritors of persecution on this side. We're inheritors of glory on the other. Amen. We've got glory coming for us if we would only call ourselves sons and daughters of God and we would give our lives to Him and we these broken pieces. So I tell you, I ask you now, are you ready? Are you ready for glory or would you rather go out and hold on to this fear and this anxiety and this worry? Would you rather hold on to it and keep it with you and let a bubble below the surface before it's too late and you can't deal with it? Are you ready to join the family and make peace? Are you ready to make peace with your fear? Are you ready to make peace with your struggle? Are you ready for the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father? Are you ready for the Prince of Peace to make peace with your sin? It's time to step out of who you used to be and step into who he would have you be. It is time today. So as the worship team comes up, this is, this is what I've got for you. Whether, whether you need to come to these altars and make peace with God, whether you need to go among the pews and make peace with someone, whether you need to go outside and make a phone call and make peace with somebody that's been bubbling below the surface. Whatever it is you've been holding on to for so long, it's just been just eating away at you and you're scared to deal with it. Whatever that is, today is the day to deal with it. Today is the day to bring those broken pieces up here and give them to God and say, I need you to put myself back together because I've tried. Today is the day. Now is the time. As I pray for us, do some talking to God and, and ask yourself, what is it that I've been putting off? What is it that I've been hiding from myself? What is it that, I, that I'm, I'm scared to do with the Lord? Take my anxiety, take my pain, take my fear, take my hurt, take all these things. I give them to you. I don't want them anymore. They're not mine. They don't belong to me anymore. They belong to you. So you can make that peace. Talking to God and really just, just, just plead for that peace. Beg for that peace. Let it wash over you. For us. Lord, you are the wonderful counselor. You are the Prince of Peace. You are the King of Kings and you are the Lord of Lords. And we know you have come to confront our sin. We know, we know you have come to make peace in our lives should we only give our lives to you. Lord, I pray as, as you speak to the people in this room, I know you are tugging on some heartstrings, and I would have you just, just, just like a rush of roaring water come into their lives. Yesterday was yesterday, and tomorrow is a brand new day. Today is a brand new day. Should they walk out those doors today, they know they have the peace of the everlasting Father in their lives. God that you are, you do a work that only you can do.